the even the people in their church wouldn't want this. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like oh, those That's nice. two. That's oh, nice. Yeah, I'll put this away. Welcome to I'd Buy That for a Dollar, a podcast about inexpensive, common, and underappreciated records. I'm your host, Sean Hartman, and I'm joined by a whole slew of guest hosts today. We have, of course, our regular co-host, Gaelic Traditionals pirated disc reseller, Peter Cook. If that is me. That's my background. And uh, Olympic eating chain of custody analyst, Jeremy Ruggles. I will follow the money. And then we have two... Extra special guest, co-founder of the Athletes Named Bob Preservation Society, John Olson. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> and, Ath- uh, what was that? Athletic Society? <laughs> uh, you, well, obviously, as you would know, you are the co-founder of the Athletes Named Bob Preservation Society. Must be some good legal stuff in Kalamazoo <laughs> these days. <laughs> I don't know nothing about that. Final guest host, neo-Latin linguistic imperialist, John Howard. Greetings. <laughs> uh, before we dive into the record, you guys want to talk at all about uh, your other pursuits, how other people may know you? Who are you people? Why are you on our microphone? Which which John wants to go first? Go for it. Go for it, Howard. Um, I'm a record store lifer at Flat Black and Circular in East Lansing, and I make a horrible racket in a useless band called Hordes, and that's about it. You do have some dollar bin knowledge. Yeah, we've 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 got the the deep dollar bin at the store, and I'm uh we scrape them clean and give them to you for uh, cheapo. And I found some things. That's <laughs> nice. A lot of them aren't dusted off, and you got to yeah, dust them off we, yourself. So we we at least take the the spores off. <laughs> <laughs> Mold. <laughs> All right, and other John. Uh, yeah, this is uh and Zane Johnny been living in uh been dealing with this cat right here for working on 30 years now or yeah. more dollar bin background my mom used to give me ten dollars a week for uh food and monday morning at 11 when i had my my lunch i would run to fbc and buy as many dollar records as i could and just wait to eat till i got home or whatever mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. borrowed lunch from a cute goth lady or whatever so I've been buying dollar bin records from this guy in FBC for 30 years, and it was the first place I heard like Smegma and uh, John Bender and wow. uh, Haystacks Balboa was the first heavy progressive record I got. Mm-hmm. I would just grab anything and as much as I could. And then when I didn't have any money, I would just haunt the free bin. Even to this day, I went on Friday and the free bin was insane. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. so, you know, I'm, I'm down to, uh, not spend money on anything you know so a dollar record is is money in the bank you know what i'm saying and like yeah. mm-hmm. in the age of uh the calendar collectors and the corner bend you know freakazoid fascists you know a dollar bin record is just you know you can't beat that you know with the 80 dollar reissues of nonsense mm-hmm. coming out today you know so Preach dollar bins man is a way of life you know what i'm saying yeah. so yeah. Mm-hmm. but to not get too involved, I will differentiate between the record store dollar bin and personally my favorite, the thrift store dollar bins, mm. uh, which is where my homeboy is from that I got in my grips. But there's such a huge difference because you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna find John Bender and Smang at a, a thrift store, you know, especially no. on Lansing stuff like that. Yeah. So, but you know, a good juggle of both is good. But personally, you know, I like the I like the thrift store ones because then it's like super local. What you got in your grip today? What'd you bring us, Mr. Olson? Oh, you want me to go first? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Another quick background on the the thriftiness of it. Uh, When I was a kid, all I wanted was a soprano saxophone and the same cat that ripped off the Black Flag record from FBC for my birthday in the eighth grade (laughs) was going to go into martial music and grab a soprano sax out of the display and dip. You know, it's kind of a wild cat, you know? (laughs) Sounds and like- uh, for years, he was like, I'm going to do it this weekend. I'm going to do it this weekend. Finally, I think he got rolled for like drugs or something like that. So, I'll, you know, I wanted the soprano sax more than anything. So I would go to 
Ace Hardware in Frandor. Mm-hmm. I would go and just make soprano saxes out of tubes and shit. You know what I'm saying? And uh, make anything that would be a soprano sax style thing for nothing. So the idea of when I finally got a soprano, I was like, this doesn't sound like this. You know, I had a friend that was uh, really into kraut rock. This older cat, Brian Day. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, you know that dude? Um, Brian, um, Brian K. Brian K. Yeah, yeah, Brian K. yeah, yeah. So anyway, you know, this is this is like in the gold mine years. You know what I'm saying? So it was like you would have to buy gold mine on Monday at FBC, dig through it, either call a cat or write in an auction to get a record. You know, so the written catalogs and all this stuff, your idea of the record would would go insane. It would make your imagination go insane. Mm-hmm. When you finally got it, it would be it'd either be a letdown or it would be insane. Like you'd read about Zol Caravan. And it would take you seven seven months or a year to get it. And when you finally got it, you're just like, oh, my God, this is insane. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I couldn't get these records. Like, I couldn't get the soprano saxophone. So what I could get and what I had access to was these Christian records, local Christian records in the thrift stores. I was like, look, man, I can't get, I can't get agitation free. You know, I can't yeah. get a... Craftwork 2 or whatever like that. So I'll just get this stuff that's cheap and it's plentiful and you can't find it anywhere else. And I've been leaning on these MFers for years. I just spent all day yesterday in Saginaw and Flint grabbing them because they're they're still there in the, the thrift stores. You know, a bunch of Northern Soul heads in Detroit would give them to me. They'd get a big collection. They'd be like, I don't want this Christian crap. Take it, you know. So it was literally handed to me. So I was able to really dig into them really understand the ones that are unique. I mean, you're not going to get electronics, you know, there's no Edgar Edgar Varese of this scene, you know, there, mm-hmm. there's no uh, Jan Deck of this scene. They're all pretty <laughs> much based heavily on Christian stuff. But what you will find that is weird in them is really just amateurness and unrock and rollness just <laughs> as far as you could get. Like, these are just made for the congregation and not even that Does some of it get a little outsider you can't roll to them that way because you know even who's kenneth kenneth higley you know mm. the dude at Dem- attic thoughts attic mm. demonstration you know that record all the outsider cats in the back of their mind they know that they're getting away with something mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. They're, they know they're weird. They know that they're going to get found, whatever. So there's always an element of vanity or rock and rollness to those, you know, like Self- John, self-aware. Yeah, just totally. Yeah. I mean, Jandek was, that was the yeah. biggest thing. Like you yeah. thought that he was a total freaker, but, and, you know, he's checking out Chris Corsano and all this stuff. Yeah. So, you know, to find a true outsider, is kind of difficult, but you know, these people have their, you know, money doesn't have anything to do with this. Sex is completely eliminated from the scene <laughs> whatsoever. A lot of them were either pressed at Owasso, where the Mot- Rich told me the Motown stuff was pressed, yep. or Jewel in Ohio, or uh, Archer, you know. So you can, it's it's so local. Once you get past the like, oh, this is an outsider, or this is drug damage, it's not. But at the same time, it absolutely is like this. Donna and Roy Mo record, you know, they, they have the stock covers. I mean, I don't think there's a covered bridge in Michigan anywhere. And <laughs> Sturgis, I'm, Michigan. I'm, they still Frank got a move. covered bridge. Yeah, Frank Frank maybe Frank that's yeah. it. But I mean, this 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 is like Kentucky or some shit. I mean, Michigan. Yeah. Let me look around us. True. You know what I'm saying? It's the clip art of clip art, yeah, which yeah, makes yeah, it yeah. even better. And uh, usually they'll just get the <laughs> clip art and they'll silk screen the information on it. Is but, there a uh, selection you'd like to play to kind of start us out with this i mean quick background is it the yeah. they're both blind it was recorded in their living room by a uh, humphrey recording service that put out a pretty well-known fbc has it all the time in the dollar bin uh, uh railroads and sound effects okay yeah yep and that's the yeah. only other thing they did but um, i know that one. <laughs> the uh it's a husband and wife and they're she collected bells from a thrift store they don't the way they sing i don't know what the hell is going on with this this is it's like your skin has like got an itch that it's trying to get off (laughs) there's nothing it's just raw i mean just pick anything it's super gnarly they're talking about that they're the best christian and all this stuff and they just look absolutely bizarre these records are just everywhere around here and i can't get enough of them you know like you know, when it's late at night and it's the winter and you're like, you know, a little stoned or something like this, these will just completely just put you upside down on your ass. <laughs> you know, rock and roll, whatever. 
there's plenty of cats that did it good, but this this is just local. You know, if you try to tell someone in Sweden about this shit, you know, and play it for them, they'll just be like, oh my god, don't ever talk to me again. Yeah. <laughs> they you don't know? understand the significance and, and just their whole relationship with religion and uh, you know Michigan. It's just incredible. I mean, like in in eighty years, these are going to be the things that you're gonna you wish you would have gotten every single one of, and I'm, I'm damn well trying to get every single one of them. You know, so there's a lot of vocal parts and stuff like that, but. Just pick any of them. They're super gnarly. The ones where it's just bells are just, it's just insane. You know, it's like, it's like nurse with wound. If he like actually had to work for his life, you know, and (laughs) didn't read J.R. Token and hang out with the coiled dorks, you know, so. What's the uh, first song on there? Let's start how Donna and Roy would have wanted us to start. The first song is uh, Glorious Cavalry. All right. Oh, I like glorious it. Glorious yep. Cavalry. On uh, Humphrey Recording Service Records. No yeah. year given the album whatsoever. Is, the album is He Gave Me You. Yeah. By Donna and Roy Moe. And right. he also gave you an ear disease or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited now. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that was twisted. <laughs> the Bells ones are super gnarly. It's just gnarly. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to get into one of those. It gave me like the monkey with the eyes wide open at the carnival kind of feel. <laughs> the chime in the like, monkey yeah, like shine, Stephen deeply, King kind of thing. Yeah. It's like highly unsettling. Even though it was like, I mean, it was better than I expected when you described it as far as like performance wise. Yeah, are these original songs of theirs, or they're not? They're, they're hymns. all there's. They come and go. I think a couple of these. I think there's one on there that one or that might be the bells ones. Okay, okay. You. but uh, I think a lot of them are. Uh, Phil Care was a, a big one, uh, but I think a lot of them are just around their church. I mean, Didium at a Grand Rapids. You know that label? Mm-hmm. That was a big Christian label, but Grand Rapids had a had a big Christian uh, scene around the uh, vicinities when it gets more towards the east it gets a little more bluegrassy you know and then you get into ranger and that kind of stuff but the the grand rapid stuff is pretty organ and choral based it's more community it's not like weird dudes in the woods and stuff so it's it's very grand rapids specific and they they had jewel press them up in ohio which was notorious for doing additives to their vinyl to make in the oil crisis to extend it, that's why a lot of jewel presses are so gnarly, which makes this even better. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So it's cool. Yeah, you were saying while we were listening to it that uh, you, we, the, regionally you get, when you kind of pursue this super subgenre, that you can get really different <laughs> vibes. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. There's kind of regional vibes, for, and uh, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio differ greatly. Or even, it sounds like you're saying even 
yeah, some city by city. And oh yeah, geographically. Well, the the thing uh, the thing that me and Rich did is uh, for our podcast is we uh, we were just doing Michigan stuff, and now that I've just been concentrating on Michigan music for a couple months now, there's so many true things that you see like there's no one ever smiles like the terry knight record we're going to talk about not goddamn smile on that thing no one smiles if they're doing something they're holding their instrument it's like very purposeful it's usually out a picture of them outside in a not such a good place you know it's just it's everything you want to brag about michigan being you know whereas wisconsin it's like lots of smiles it's like a couple it's usually in color one weird thing about private press Christian records and kind of Michigan records in general is there's no doubles. There's no double LPs. Oh, yeah. No. Like very, not. very yeah. few. And if they are, it'll be one record with a blank gatefold. You know, it's just weird. Mm-hmm. And there's right. a there's a complete lack of avant classical records from Michigan, which when I was talking to Tove, my wife Tova about it, she was just like, well, you know, Michigan really doesn't have that many schools. It has Interlochen and U of M. But, you know, in terms of like early 60s and 50s whacked out electronic records, they really don't exist in Michigan. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's, it's all traditionally based, you know. So to really look for the weird homemade stuff, it's all around you in the thrift store. Have you found much you know? Michigan New Age? I haven't. No, not at all. No, the, no, no. no. There's, a, there's a lot of people talking about meditation that Archer pressed, which... Yeah isn't music but it's still new age and then there's like uh there's 16 speed stuff yeah yeah <laughs> there's uh the stray winds record which is more haunted than new yeah. age or anything like that but no it's it's very like electronics and saxophones for that unless you go to detroit and start to get into like the, the tribe kind of stuff and the r&b stuff horn uh saxophones don't really make an appearance either it's so country and bluegrass based you know because like fortune and everyone they started from the country angle you know so bluegrass and country music is kind of the platform where all this stuff kind of took off but you know the christian stuff there's really just bizarre booger eating stuff around you just gotta you know and it's and it's for a dollar That's, man it's not you ain't gonna break the bank that you know? is the official subgenre yeah. name <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, you were passing the record around while we were listening to it, and you talked about kind of the clip art front, but the back has actual pictures of Donna and Roy, and I don't. The vibes I'm getting are like nowadays they would just be meth heads, but <laughs> uh, in that day they got addicted to God and making this music. So, yeah, I mean they look they're really frightening looking, you know, and uh. The her, I don't know if you can play it later, but her bells that she found in the trash are not very harmonious at all. You know, <laughs> if you're talking about if you're talking about God's power, it's ten cents and under. You know, at the most. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hear a clip of that. The Let's bells. Do we, would, yeah, do we know I which think, cut. Uh, that would be the third one, or i think it would be the third or fourth one it'd be one of the shorter ones you can see in there okay Okay. yeah it might be the next the next one looks pretty short yeah it would definitely be that you have a good reach there sean your needle might reject it yeah (laughs) (laughs) this is uh near the near the cross Even weirder is that uh, I think the uh, smallest amount you could press with Jewel, the the printing press for doing this was five hundred. So I mean, it's just like that's a lot, man. You know, four hundred and ninety nine <laughs> yeah. out there. And it's it's a style that another weird 
congruent thing about these things is there's no year. It's really hard to find the year on these things, but I'm going to guess this is 71 or 69. Oh, is it really that, that far yeah. along? Um, but it stopped around 80, this whole style, you know, which is kind of sad, but there's so many of them, you know? Yeah. And you can go to a, a, like, yesterday I went to Saginaw and Flint, and the thrift stores were just filled with records of this style. Not as whacked out as this, but whacked out in their own way of just church records from around there. So it's incredible. It's amazing that they're still there, you know? Yeah, those bells almost uh, sounded like Ruth Underwood playing the marimba very badly. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. I, I mean, I, I, I liked it. What was the name of that cut again? What, what uh, near the Cross. Near the Cross. Yeah. They're in near brain damage, you said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And the the song that closes the side or uh, the second to last song is uh, Roy talking about how he's the best Christian, which is just weird, you know. I guess it's a competition. <laughs> Self righteous, yeah. <laughs> Storing up those treasures in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know like information about these artists, or is this just like the the most the most you could tell is that around Grand Rapids, uh, Didium was the big one. They use Jewel as a pressing plant, and it it just gets smaller. This is from Middleville. They gleamed what they could from the ones that were successful because Didium put out a couple of hip priest ones. There's a famous one, I forget who it is, where the pastor's surfing, you know, Ooh. and they would have, like, some <laughs> surf numbers. But they would sell a lot, so they would gleam the record pressing and the, the shine from that, and just it'd be like, you know, a big Lansing church record i'm trying to like it'd be like earthen vessel you know what i'm saying Mm. and then you would go to charlotte and it would just funnel down into people playing bells from the trash (laughs) it's impossible to find like real quick we had we got our house refinanced and at the end the woman who was doing all the paperwork she's just like is it okay if i give you a book about my experience with alcoholism and god and i'm just like hell yeah you can man that's cool so she gave me this book self-published book about her relationship with christ through becoming sober and i was like well you know i collect weird christian records and i showed her a couple and she's like oh pastor jim like oh he was looking pretty good back in those days so it's so local that you got to be in the church to even like get in there man you know yeah, yeah, so know. it's it's like <laughs> click times 10 you know like christians with attitude style yeah. you know? he used to hang out with him what was he like <laughs> yeah oh he's not he's not christian anymore oh no, no. Oh. Yeah, yeah so i mean it's just genius it's like it's in the soil around these small towns you know battle yeah. battle creek was a huge huge spot for christian stuff family altar of air or whatever one of uh, we talked about a couple days ago that that was from there and it was just you know michigan's full of this stuff it's it's a gen- once you tap into it it's genius you know yeah and i think it, at surface level it's really easy to pick up a record like this and just think like oh it sounds crazy it's weird but once you really think about it there's like there's so many other elements to approach this kind of music so there's, it's interesting the earnestness that they're approaching this from uh, yeah you know whether it's they were thinking this is their outreach this is their mission in life they're going to record a, a record because that's what the kids are into and then everybody in their area of michigan is going to be saved from this or maybe you know it was like this is the best music that they could create and then because of that weird kind of click cultish church mentality there's no one to critique it you know because it's, it's more about the energy that they're putting into it kind of thing so no one's going to say like oh well you're not playing good music because you're playing it for god and that's all that matters so then you get these amazing records like this where like like you said probably half the people in their church hated this you know probably like got a copy just to be nice kind of thing and it's just amazing that the recorded uh, evidence of this is still around and you know lurking for a dollar yeah well it's like it's like mom spaghetti style too like don and roy didn't get a record a year deal you know it was yeah, one and yeah. done you know so. yeah recording technology was not democratized at this point so they're really like bla- blazing trails as DIYers recording in their home and all that yeah, yeah. I mean, this was probably like their life savings yeah. to put this record out <laughs> well i don't i don't think that i think um they used from what i can tell a couple of people that i talked to that did records in the style it was from church money. Okay. Oh. So there was no personal money involved. So they didn't care that there was 500 to go in the trash. You know, it was yeah. like, you know, there wasn't, you wouldn't buy this. You know, you wouldn't, uh, you would just give it to the congregation. Yeah. You know? And your, your membership gets you a free copy. Yeah. Type of deal. <laughs> well, that, you, you know, Skater Dave, right? Yes. He was friends with a Christian site collector 
And there was a big Christian distribution service in the 60s and 70s that was in the Midwest that people would sell these just to funnel in to play on other Christian radios, but they wouldn't because there was so many of them. So that was the only, there's no promos of this. There's no radio station copies and stuff like that. But conversely, Detroit Gospel, that's majority of them were promos and for radio play because it was so such thing. But no one was playing this on the radio. I mean, country people might do it, but there was no reason to hear Don and Roy. Just go to their house and Watch him eat baby bones in the corner, you know. <laughs> well, should we get another cut on here? Yeah. One more cut? Do you have any particular uh, one? Uh, just keep going, just keep man. Going. It, it just gets worse, yeah. I want to hear that one where Roy talks about how cool he is. Yeah. That, second to last that's, one. Uh, that's yeah, that's second the last second to last one, one yeah. Right. What's that one called? Uh, the Best Christian That Somebody Knows. Oh, yes. It's yeah. right in the title. Christian that somebody knows, oh challenge that rings in my soul, Lord grant that Christ Jesus shall reign in my heart, my life and my will to control, I am the best Christian that somebody knows, that somebody knows, that somebody knows, Lord help them to see Christ Jesus in me, I am the best Christian that somebody knows, I am the one Bible that somebody reads. The Bible they follow each day. Lord, let my life shine with the Spirit and divine that points to the bright homeward way. Oh, I am. The I'm convinced. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting angle. I think on the podcast we pride ourselves in digging up old records that have no marketing or following or anything now but this is interesting because there never was like a lot of the ones we pick were big at in one their time day, and yeah then, and there was an excess of them that's so that's why there's their dollar yeah. yeah yeah and uh this was never marketable <laughs> it wasn't even saleable they just gave them yeah. away so there's no uh, UPC, no nothing. I mean, it's like the the people's home addresses on there, which is just insane, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's Corwood Industries essentially. <laughs> <laughs> but even even his was a PO box. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, Jane you know, Mac. no, this is a really cool uh, kind of a different angle than anything we've done previously. But it's yeah. totally something. I mean, there's probably across the country f- from this time period thousands of different records like this available in bargain bands. Well, just, I mean, I, I get rid of the ones that are just choral. I mean, I don't get rid of them, but I, the ones I kept that are like this, you know, the Ikea cubes, I'll, I can show you in my room. I've got like almost two rows of ones like this just from around here. Even they appear to be going nowhere. I, I want to get every single one of them. And at night, when you're, I don't know if you guys smoke, but if you're smoking, it just really fucks with your DNA like real bad <laughs> when you listen to this stuff and you're like, oh my God, like the blood of Christ is almost too real. A true rite right of passage. <laughs> yeah. Um, I forget who told me. One of my rock and roller friends. Do you know the band Comets on Fire? You know yeah, those? absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know Noel? I don't really know the band. The members, guy who played it. electronics, you know that dude? He, he told my friend Nate, he's like, you know, if in the 2000s, if you think you're going to make a rock record, you're an asshole. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and it's like, nah, well. Nah. Ben Chasney was in Comets on Fire at one point. Yeah, 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 yep, yep. Either look at old rock or new rock or something like that, or you just take a right turn and don't deal with rock at all. And that's why I like these. I think I found a lot of record collectors I've encountered have that in common. Once you 
dive in far enough into these subgenres. Rock and roll just seems increasingly kind of boring. There's just so much interesting shit that like no one is digging up like this. And like once you hear more and more of this kind of complete weirdo stuff, then the same hard rock records that everybody else is looking for just seems a little too standard. Well, it seems like the cats that do it right are the dirt bombs and like Detroit style stuff because they reference and and their knowledge of the history of rock and roll is so much better. And they add a lot more to the ingredients rather than just a boner and a $20 off from Guitar Center. You know what I'm saying? Which I don't think anyone wants to hear that. Might as well just go to Sweetwater, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were just going off the other day about the hundreds of bands that want to be Neil Young now. And, oh, God. Uh, it's the, like Neil Young's done that enough already. Yeah. Talk, the jamming stuff. You're talking about Beyond, Beyond, Beyond. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sh- oh man. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's, it's as tired as like, it, yeah, we know we can, you can finger pick now. Yeah. 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 Got, you, you used know, to play punk rock. Now you can finger pick. Yeah. You used to, you used <laughs> to play electronics through a bo- broken fender amp, but you know, you got bills to pay in a kid. So you got to show everyone you can play. So, mm-hmm. oh my God, Neil Young's the best, which is more mostly to do against Sebado because that du- Sebado dude was like, Neil Young is awesome. Lou yeah. Barlow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then all these cats were like, yeah, man. Neil Young, Harvest, Man Needs a Name, Made, Chicken, you know, boom, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> everyone's favorite Neil Young. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, yeah, thank you for bringing this uh, LP. You know, I kind of been vaguely aware that stuff like this happened, but I haven't dove into this genre hard myself. Well, it's it's also good because I'm sure you guys know Slinging Records and, you know, Slinging mm-hmm. Records is that the whole rarity thing is a nuisance it's claustrophobic like no one gives a fuck about how rare your shit is you know what i'm saying like right. a cat's gonna have a rare thing you know that being said i like to show off some rare shit you know like anyone else but to have that be based upon this and that it's you know back in the day it was rare because it, it represented a culture or it had a unique folk angle or something like that these are all that but it, the price tag's not involved. Who cares about the price? You know, you go to a thrift store, you see a dude like looking shit up on Discog. You know, you don't want to hang with that cat. No, you know that mm-hmm. that's a calendar collector. You yeah, know, I'm just looking at yeah. So you you got to get into the culture of it, and when you dive into this stuff, soul and and all the stuff, especially that Michigan has, then then that's some rare stuff that has an essence to it that will translate well over the years and not through like whatever somebody thinks is rare or something like that. You know, like, like psych used to be a tag that you would hang out with somebody be like, Oh, that dude's in the psych. That's cool. Now you don't want it. that's like a red flag. Yeah. <laughs> you want to, you want to dip from that dude. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like someone telling you I'm a DJ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Uh-oh. laughs> <Uh-oh. laughs> yeah. So both of uh, the Johns we have here, you have been uh, obviously long before record collecting became what it has now, you've been involved. It's really changed in the last 20 years, especially, I would say, in the advent of the internet and those type of people looking up stuff on their phones and whatnot. Is it, have you seen the spaces in which this happens really change in, the, in that amount of time? Like the, or, or the the same people still hanging around doing this. No, I, I saw a lot of the cats I used to hang with in the eighties who were doing this, were buying multiple copies of everything. Mm-hmm. And they've become hermits. They end up getting sucked in to the, you know, once eBay started and then discogs, they lose their social skills. And when I see them on the street, they're like, they have a want list. They're like, Hey, have you seen any of these come through your store? And it's like, Oh, hi, how you doing? You know, yeah. they can't talk about life anymore. <laughs> it's just like, I have this want list from this guy in Croatia and he wants these that were pressed in like 50, you know, an edition of 50. And do you have this at your store right now? And it, it's, a, you know, it is detrimental to your social skills that or can be if you get sucked into this like chasing that down things that are rare, not because of quality. And well, you uh, got the, you got the dude who was sweating you on corner bends. Uh, yeah. You posted that. Yeah. 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 There, there's guys that still went up when I saw on discogs, we, we get the guys who do the cut and paste. Does this have corner bends? Does that pops? Does it have noise? I was like, you didn't read my listing. Did you, you know, just like <laughs> you know, social skills, you know, yeah. like it's funner to find this stuff in the wild as the other John here knows too. It's like, it's the ones in the wild that you remember, like, yeah, just finding random crap. But before I worked at FBC, I found my my first dollar bin score where I was like, whoa, it was um Cooper with his thumb sticking out his zipper, and it was in the dollar bin original cover. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, in nineteen eighty or whatever it was, I was like, wow, this is cool for a dollar. You, you know, get a fire under that, and then found um like three bucks or something the first Buzzcock seven inch 
Spiral Scratch. Oh, the but, one that uh, Howard Devoto yeah, was on? but oh, it was wow. the original, but before it said with Howard Devoto. Uh-huh. It's just, just Buzzcocks. And I was like, holy crap. They don't know what this is. <laughs> and, the uh, Spiral yeah, Scratch? The Spiral Scratch. Yeah, but with, great. Before, it, before they printed Devoto's name on the cover. Uh-huh. You get that itch for things in the wild like that, not so much on the internet yeah you do see those people coming into my store too with their just their nose into discogs as they're looking and a lot of that stuff we find we'll look that stuff up it's like a 50 or 80 dollar record and we listen to it and we're like holy crap dude this is awful and uh <laughs> like a guy sounds like a sick seal singing or something it's on psych <laughs> records too yeah. and on a lot of um, cool. a lot, yeah <laughs> <laughs> Might be yeah <laughs> Uh, yeah <laughs> yeah that, that's definitely been a big shift in record collecting that i've seen there's the people that are buying stuff just because it's rare or trying to flip something and then people maybe coming at it from a little bit newer angle only buying stuff that they think they're supposed to buy the, mm-hmm. the essential classic rock records to start their collection or the things that they've seen on pitchfork or whatever that are getting hyped i've even had it before where someone will ask about a record in the store and i don't have it i'll be like hey here's a couple other records that are similar that I think you might like, and they'll mm-hmm. listen to it. And I've had people say things like, yeah, I, I like it, but I, I've got to go home and think about it before I can buy it. Or <laughs> yeah, listen yeah. To it more. Listen to it more. Oh, see, yeah. See if anybody cool has talked about this record before I can buy it kind of thing. Like, there's a lot of people have lost that simple mentality of listening to a record, do you like it, and then buying it. Actually collecting records for the music. It's kind what of you, a lost art. Do you guys remember uh, Young Soul Rebels from Detroit? You remember mm-hmm. that story? Yeah, yeah, remember that? Yeah. Dion and uh, Dave were like, the reason that shop went down is because, and this is, you know, nowadays everyone just listens on streaming service. Mm -hmm. If you like the Yada Yas, here's 90 watered down versions of the Yada Yas. But Dion said that his shop went down and record culture in general went down is because when we were all growing up, you would look at something and you would try to see where it came from and be like, oh, this happened because of this. And you would go back to try to kind of find the source. You Mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And now you give somebody a record and then that's it. It came out of nowhere. You don't care the history of it. You don't, which is just, it's just weird. Yeah, there there was always the natural progression for me. You get a record, then you you look at the label, you look at their their mention section. And if they mention other artists, you go try and find that. Yeah. You know, read Mm -hmm. some interviews, see who they're talking about. Like, who were they listening to to make this record? And it's this whole world of exploration and it's, always been fascinating to me how many people just don't have any interest in doing that kind of digging on on a positive i still get random people younger kids who are doing blind buying too they'll go around since we have so many different genres broken down they'll just seemingly pick like eight different things from around the store blindly and i'll ask them i was like do you know anything about this like nope just like the cover or just trying things out and when they're (laughs) cheap it's like you know from our dollar bin and 50 cent bin but also like two and three dollar records you know, people will take a chance on that, and I could just lean over the counter and kiss them for that. But you know, they're, they're few and far between. But there's still there's still kids getting that that itch, which yeah. is good. Yeah, you know, we are advocates of that on the show, so we'd like to welcome you to our congregation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the best, very, the best record. Very glad that. Well, it, it <laughs> seems from records. looking at your guys' site that it seems like a lot of these dollar bins are LPs, yeah. whereas singles are just dying by the day. You know, like a a dollar for a single, A, you don't see them, the amounts of LPs versus singles. Yeah, especially at thrift stores. You used to find boxes of them and thrift stores don't even carry them anymore for the most part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're they're really gone. And it's it's just like a lost art form. The last batch of singles I got at thrift, um, somebody had bagged like 20 of 80s, like jukebox singles with picture sleeves. And it was like one dollar for an entire bag of them. And we're like, hell yeah. But I mean, they, yeah, they just, they get no respect. <laughs> they uh, <laughs> forgotten format. But I mean, that that being said, the 80s picture sleeve ones are, are the main press ones are some of the most horrible oh, yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. we are the world I, times no, 30. No, bro, yeah. Bros, man. We got a bros seven inch. Yeah. <laughs> when will I be famous? <laughs> I tell you that, that 45 on 33 is great. <laughs> Well, thank you guys for coming and uh, talking some records with us, and uh, come back again and talk with us, uh, John. You have a yeah. John John's further John, yeah, further John, John yeah. Howard. You have a record you're going to talk about the next episode. So I think we're going to wrap this one up here. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, this has been I buy that for a dollar, and I am Peter Cook. I'm Jeremy Ruggles. I'm Sean Hartman. Uh, and Zane Johnny. <laughs> and John Howard. <laughs> <laughs>
Fantastic. All right. Fantastic. We're gonna. I'm gonna flip this over. Let's flip this over and hear a B side cut to go okay. out on. I'm curious how deep it goes. Well, it goes deep. <laughs> down the rabbit. I don't hole. think you want to go down that cave. <laughs> 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 Thank you for listening to another fantastic episode of I'd Buy That for a Dollar. Just a reminder, we have a live event coming up in Kalamazoo, Michigan. If you're one of the less than 20% who listen to us in Kalamazoo, uh, March 27th, Green Door Distillery. 7 p.m. doors, 8 p.m. live podcast. That's it. How'd you know? I had an inkling. As always, you can hit us up. I buy that podcast at gmail.com on whatever social media sites you like. We're probably there. And we have a Patreon. Don't forget, we have premium episodes featuring 45s, singles like uh, Mr. Olson mentioned. We'll get even deeper dive into the 45s. So <laughs> come find us on patreon.com slash I'd buy that podcast. Thank you. As alone there he stayed, but he came back. He just went there to pray.